This is a geek leader. Hey, Geek Leaders, welcome to episode 181 of Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. And today's episode is brought to you by Live at Manning Conferences, Math for Data Science. If you're securing a job in data science, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, or cryptography, or any other programming field, you have to realize that it requires strong math skills. And the Live at Manning Conference series is doing an event, Math for Data Science, and it is a unique chance to learn from some of the statisticians and other math masters that are involved in the Manning Network of Experts. And it's a free event, which is awesome. It's live on Twitch on December 1st, um, on December 1st, 2020 at noon Eastern time. And you can find out more about that at geekleader.com slash math. Again, that's geekleader.com slash math. <laughs> All right, Geek Leaders, today on the show, I've got Krista Zendroy's voice, and she is the Chief Strategy Officer for Hendel Group, and today we're going to talk about leadership, coaching, and some of the things that I need help on when it comes to uh, soft skills, communication, and uh, making improvements and change management within our team. Uh, Krista, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, to help our audience kind of understand your career journey and your background, and just to, to lay some context for this conversation, can you tell people how you got to where you are today and what that journey has been like for you? Sure. So uh, I started off my career in retail slash fashion, and it was my biggest dream to actually work for a big retail company. Like, I really did want to go be the person who dressed the mannequins at J. Crew. That was my dream. Uh, and I actually figured out, figured out a way to make that happen, uh, much to my own surprise. I didn't have all the contacts or connects or even the uh, true education to really be in that space, but I was really committed and figured out my way, basically sort of like wiggled my way into the field. And um, once I got there, my big goal was to become an executive before I was 30. That was my really big dream. I just kind of made it up one day and I thought that would be really cool and make me proud. And so I went on that journey. And what I discovered as I grew in my career was that being a manager is much more um, hands-on and tactical than being a leader is. And so I didn't really know how to lead. I had no idea what I was doing. I really thought that if I kept working harder and doing my job, better and more efficiently that that was going to help me lead a team and that was so wrong and so it actually got to the point where I was growing in my career I was getting promoted I had more people underneath me and I was failing mm -hmm. and so my solution to failing was I should quit and one of my friends and colleagues recommended I get a coach and I was very against the idea I was like no I don't want to do that a coach can't help me they don't understand me I, any way that I could have been defensive and sh killed the idea, like shot it down, I did. But my friend was persistent as she had a coach and uh, she was like, you really need one. You really need one. So finally I listened and I got myself a coach and it was a life changer. I really got that I needed to learn how to lead and the coach really helped me figure out how to do that. So how I ended up as a coach at, at Handel Group is that in that process of being coached, I fell in love with coaching and realized, oh, wow, somebody really does this, ha have, has this job. Like somebody really does go help people figure out their career and how cool is that? And I decided that I wanted to learn how to do it. And so um, through training and being part time for a while uh, as a coach and still kind of managing my full time a uh, fashion job, uh, I finally got to the realization that it was time to make a career change. And here I am. I've been a coach now with Hendel Group for about 10 years. Um, I work with teams and leaders and helping them be more efficient, scale, and have better communication. And officially, as of the this year, I'm also the chief strategy officer for Hendel Group, and I'm helping the company scale and grow, which is really exciting because I get to marry what I used to do in fashion and in retail with um, what I do now in coaching. Awesome. And uh, let me ask you a random question. Um, how important is fashion when it comes to leadership and management, or is that important? It's such a good question. I've <laughs> asked it. And a story comes to mind. So I'll right. 
story. So a very long time ago when I was first coaching and actually still working um, in retail uh, and I was moonlighting as a coach and I had this one client who was a lawyer at this really fancy law firm in Boston and she was up for partner and we were working on upgrading her leadership and just helping her figure out how to just have that presence and gravitas you need to survive, you know, at the level of partner in a law firm. And one day we were using, I think at the time it was Skype, uh, to do our call and she stood up and she was wearing Crocs. And I was like, Oh, I like, I like your Crocs. Like, ha ha ha. And she was like, Oh, thanks. I wear them every day. And I was like, well, do you wear them to work? And she's like, yes. And I was just like, we are going to throw away the Crocs. <laughs> um, what was true for her is that she really was a smart up and coming powerful lawyer, but the way that she presented herself was very different from that. She presented meek and sort of like at a trend and part of what she was dealing with in really securing that, that seat of partner was getting people to see her for who she really was. And as much as we all don't want to admit it, uh, how we present ourselves really does matter. And it really is important that we are dressing and um, just pre presenting ourselves in a way that's connected to our own values so that we're not trying to fit into a, a particular mold, but also that we are clear that there are certain um, signals to people. There are certain signals to people when they're looking at you. And if you're a leader who is showing up sort of like frumpy or not really standing straight with your shoulders back or you're sort of meek, um, in your demeanor, it's going to work against you. Because what happens is in the brain, the brain is expecting a leader and it has a, like a determination or like a bias as to what leader should look like. And when you show up in not your best or what people would consider your best, there, there's going to be sort of like some level of like a misfit for the person that you're working with. And then that can cause like a hurt in your credibility and the level of trust that you can have with the people you're leading. Yeah, I agree. I think up front, it makes a huge difference. Um, there's so many, uh, I hate using this term, but unconscious biases within us that, that we see when we see someone, you know, how their how their appearance are, how they dress. Um, and for me, like, I'm, I'm terrible. My, my wife would call me, you know, how some people are tone deaf. My wife says I'm color deaf. And, and I, have, I have a difficulty of finding two things that look good together. So um, that's why I subscribe to Stitch Fix and they, they get all my clothes and, and it makes it a little bit easier for me going forward. But, you know, 100 percent correctly, when you see something that doesn't quite look like it's presented at its best, then you feel like, well, everything they do must not be presented at its best. Yeah. And, um, and exactly. whether that's true or not, it's just that initial uh, response that you get. And you see someone that's unkept, you say, well, they, won't even, they don't even like, you know, uh, pull their clothes out of the dryer before it gets wrinkly. Why am I to think that they're going to, you know, write good code, you know, and, and take care of that stuff? Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, the unconscious mind right where that where those biases live that you were referencing really does use shortcuts to be able to make snap judgments and decisions like that's how it really kind of processes all the data that it collects and it collects way more data uh, than the conscious mind so you'll naturally have an affinity for or be drawn to somebody um, because of your bias and that all said uh, as a leader, when you're trying to influence team and inspire team and build cohesion, if people don't feel naturally drawn to you because they're a little bit like, I don't know about that, it's going to be harder for you to do that. So as a technique and a strategy, definitely dress appropriately mm -hmm. in your you know, industry and have it be true to who you are. You know, I always make the joke, uh, I really do go into insurance companies wearing leather pants. <laughs> which is not fitting for the industry. Like if I'm coaching an insurance company, I am wearing leather pants or big chunky jewelry. That's a part of my personality. So it's important for you to be able to also stand out so that people can see your point of difference and get that you're not just somebody that that's going to blend into the background, but there are rules to follow in terms of how do you stand out just enough and then also make sure that it's fitting within the context of the setting. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think, uh, you know, you don't want to look the exact same. And I, I talk about that when I talk about resumes, right? I, I mean, when I'm hiring someone and I get a resume, if they all look the exact same, you know, I, I don't even read very much of it. You know, I, my eyes just kind of 
fade off to this distance. If they look really silly, like they have some kind of curvy, you know, font that's, you know, silly, then I'm going to throw that out altogether because it's completely irrelevant. But yet if they have that a little bit different, but they're still high class, they're high end, and, and it, it's just a different looking thing, it's going to draw my attention and make it stand out because it's slightly different. And I think that what you're talking about is almost the same thing. Yes, precisely. So help me out with some, some, uh, you know, you're, you, you moved into leadership coach. You said you took some training to get there. Um, and what, what, what is that training like? Like, for example, if, if I'm a, um, you know, a CIO or CTO at a company and decide that my next career move is to uh, get into coaching, because I feel like, you know, one of the big things that a CIO or director needs to do to their people is also not just be a manager, but a leader and also a coach to some of them. Um, how, what is your thoughts on that? Is that something they should do? Is that something they should think about or, or not? So, you know, interestingly, one of the reasons why I started to train to be a coach is because I thought it would help me in my career. Like I didn't have the big desire in the beginning to switch to become a coach full time. I really did think, you know, I'll do this part time once in a while. It's kind of fun, but really I'm going to leverage these skills for my own leadership in my career. So, at um, first pass, my response is, I think it's wonderful for people to go get coaching, to learn the skills that they need to learn to be better mentors and leaders and mm -hmm. as you said, coaches to their people. Um, the way I like to look at coaching and the way I have my clients frame it for themselves is that a coach really sits on your board of advisors. It really is like somebody that is there to ensure that you're making the right personal and business decisions, and it's just one seat. So it's really each person's job to ensure they put the right people in the right seats. So getting a coach and vetting a coach is important um, for that purpose, because it really is somebody who's there to guide you. And what's true about a coach is that they don't necessarily have to do your job or know the ins and outs of your day to day, because the coach is not there to tell you how to do what you already know how to do. The coach is there to elevate you and grow you as a person. And as somebody who can step into an expansiveness and um, the possibility that leadership requires people to step into. So that's the first answer to the question. Okay. Uh, what is true? Uh, many people who become coaches end up becoming technical coaches, which means they really go coach or develop people at a skill set that they know. Mm -hmm. And skill sets are important. But what's true about human beings is that it's really hard to impact what people do without understanding how they do things or why they do things. So the truth is any of us can learn a new skill. It's very easy. Like if anyone listening right now, I'm sure there's something on your list that you wanted to do. And, and I know it's 2020, so I get it's the year <laughs> of all crazy, but I'm sure there's things on that list that you wanted to do in 2020 that you probably wanted to do in 2019 and might even carry over into 2021, right? The truth is you probably know how to do that thing. You probably really do know how to get training. I have to spend time doing it. I have to commit myself, all these things. You might need some skills development, but mostly you, you can figure out the roadmap. The mm -hmm. reason why you don't do it, you probably don't know. Some of you might have a couple of inklings, but the truth is like the why and understanding the inner workings of people is really paramount in being able to shift them. So what I like to say in terms of answering the second part of your question is, yes, being a technical coach is wonderful, but it's really important you get trained up in what makes people tick so you could really guide them. I like to say it this way when I'm working with clients, anybody can like go onto YouTube and watch like the seven things you should, you should do to lose seven pounds by Saturday. Like, <laughs> anybody can do that. That's a technique you can use and you will lose seven pounds by Saturday. If we all ate kale, <laughs> we would lose seven pounds by Saturday, possible. But that's not going to be a mindset shift. That's just going to be a technique you're using. So what causes true, I guess I would say, like up-leveling for people is a mindset shift. So if you are considering becoming a coach, it's important to go learn how to do those mindset shifts for people. Otherwise, it's hard to be effective. So what's that process look like? Is that like an immediate change? You know, you, you, you find out something new, your whole mind shift shift uh, or set just shifts, or is it something more gradual with like small iterations? You know, human beings are a tough species, <laughs> I'm like chuckling about it. We're really hard. Um, just because we know how to do something or understand something doesn't necessarily mean that we could 
do it in application or when we're called to go do it. So uh, most of us really go learn things at the level of mind and try to process it, do our own analysis, try to connect the dots for ourselves. And that's great. And we need to go do that. But the way that uh, we really do truly deeply understand things is through an integration process where you get the opportunity to feel something deeply and to go live it out. Mm -hmm. So it is slow, it is incremental, and it does require that you go do all the work on yourself first. Um, you know, one of the rules we have at Hindal Group is that you really truly have to do every single assignment you'd ever give to your clients. So anytime I'm working with someone and I have them go do something like, you know, go talk to their boss about a particular topic or have a difficult conversation with their parents or look at all the reasons why they don't like the direct reports and, you know, talk, tell me why they think the direct reports suck or whatever it might be. I've done all, of the, all those assignments. And I had to do them to understand the process that one has to go through to be able to deal with that so mm -hmm. that I can move people through it. Fundamentally, I think we can all get why it's important to go make that list and deal with your direct reports, but it, it's not enough to just know you have to actually have lived something out. Mm. So if you're like, let's say you are a, um, a C-level, like a, a CTO or CIO over, you know, many different groups and different uh, sections, you know, like you, maybe you're in charge of the help desk, you're in charge of the server administration, the team, the, the uh, development team, the testers, the project managers. How do you go about helping relate to each one of those groups and, and getting the mindset that you have to, you know, you have to live it, right? How, how, do, you, how do you do that with so many different teams and, and or, or do you not? Do you, do you just go a level above that? So I subscribe to um, the idea that it's important to have relationship building strategies mm -hmm. and politicking strategies for people that you manage up to. So if you're the CIO or CTO, that would be the board or your CEO, mm -hmm. people that you manage across to, so your fellow um, executive team, and then the people that you manage down to, which is the people that you're leading. And anywhere where you don't have a strong strategy or a level of solid relationships, it's going to be hard for you to push your initiatives through and to deliver on results. So mm -hmm. I really come from the place of it all matters and you have to care deeply about every single person that you're interacting with because they all have to deliver and produce for you. So that's the kind of first piece of it. Mm -hmm. The second piece of it is that in order to lead effectively, right? So leaders really care about people and managers care about process. You have to be really smart about differentiating for yourself what part of your job is about managing the process and then what part of your job is about leading the people. And they're very separate functions. Most of us get really caught up in the day-to-day -day and manage the process and kind of do a little bit of people. Mm -hmm. So it's important to actually sit down and go, okay, what does it look like for me to lead the people? And then there's, you know, from there we can, there's a bazillion and one ways we can break that down. There's like, okay, like really knowing the leaders of each of those functions that report into you. There's understanding the pain points of the business units that you're supporting. There is getting what the people who you're interacting with really care about, like on a level of what they want to push forward in the organization or what they need from the organization or from your teams um, that might be helping them and pushing through ideas. So it's important you spend the time to really get to know what people care about. You really do have to care more about what people care about than what you care about, because the only way it works to get buy-in and coalesce a team is if people feel supported. Mm -hmm. So taking that time to really understand what people care about an organization and figuring out how you can be useful and authentically figuring that out is a very important step. So uh, go, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I want to teach something. So, because I think it's a valuable thing to go teach. Mm -hmm. uh, relationships live on two levels. There is the responsibility side of a relationship. And that is where 
you know, all the things that you do day to day where the process really lives, right? Like, do you mm-hmm. reply to emails? Are you, you know, communicative? Do you go to the meetings? Are you on time? You know, are you meeting your deliverables, right? There's the responsibility side. And then there's the rapport side of a relationship, which is, do you vibe? Do you like them? Do you respect them? Do you, you know, uh, have a level of like credibility and trust? And what happens is a lot of times that people will lean into one side more than the other. Like, okay, like I do my job, I do it well, I deliver. And then they, we kind of don't care about the rapport. Or you might lead into the rapport side a little bit more and then, you know, kind of blow things off. But because people adore you, it's okay. The truth is anywhere in any relationship where they're, the rapport side and the responsibility side are not in equilibrium, it causes a problem. And so as leaders, and I have all my leaders do this, I literally have them sit down and go, okay, who are all the people that you have to interact with? And I give them this big chart for how to do this. And I'm like, who are the people you interact with who need to be like in your posse, knowing you, loving you, getting you. And then I have them go through the assignment of, okay, responsibility. Like, are you good with them? Do you deliver? Do you like cancel meetings all the time? Are you responsive? Like, let's give that a rating. Okay. What about the rapport side? How do you feel about them? And then whatever is not like in sync, we go to work on. Hmm. So basically you're, you know, trust and rapport are, 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 are these like the most important thing that a new leader needs to, needs to try to build and focus on? Or, or I guess that, that it all involves, you know, getting to know your team first and then building that trust and rapport. Is that right? Yes. The first step is to deeply get to know your people. Everyone has a different level of what they need to feel seen, heard, and appreciated. And it's important for leaders to figure out what that is and mm-hmm. spend the time doing it. Um, first and foremost, right? I'm recalling an instance where when I used to lead a team, I'm somebody who likes to give recognition mm-hmm. and because I like it. So I, you know, in a meeting, if my boss called me out and said, Hey, great job on this, I would be really happy. I would feel like I'm cloud nine. And I would oftentimes in my uh, meetings with my team would, would call out people and recognize them publicly. And I had a couple of people who hated it. They just literally despised it. And I was like, Oh, they're just shy. <laughs> um, no, they're not shy. They hate it. And I was actually doing it a service. And what I was missing was go find out what they like. And it turns out that that particular person, um, the the two people that they were working together on a team really liked for me to go spend time with them and to really sit with them and train them. And I did pretty much none of that because I was too busy. So it's important to figure out what do your people need um, to feel cared for. And then by caring about them, you build your credibility. You build your trust. Mm-hmm. I think you're hundred percent right. I know um, I had a former employee that mornings was not his thing. Right. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I try to make it a point when I first got uh, this new position to go around and tell my team, you know, good morning. How are you doing? You know, try to, and I don't really like doing that either, but I feel like it was the right thing to do at the time. And this person always said, Hey, back to me. And then after I got to know them, you know, through one-on-ones and just working with them for a while. One point they said, you know what? It annoys the crap out of me that you tell me good morning every morning. And I was like, what? He's like, I just, I'm just tired. I just want to like get my day going. I don't want to have to stop and say, yeah, good morning and pretend like I'm all happy. <laughs> and it's just one of those things where I didn't realize that. And I thought I was doing the nice thing and the right thing. Um, but until I got to know them, I realized that I was just, you know, really pissing them off. Yeah. Yeah. And you didn't mean to, you were really trying to be the best boss you could be. And then, you know, kudos to that person who was like, hi, this really irritates me. That level of honesty doesn't happen often in an organization. So it's great that that person demonstrated that. And it's an important uh, note for people listening to take away. You want that level of honesty from your people. You want to go ask them, Hey, like, how am I doing and leading you? Mm-hmm. How am I doing? Like, is this working for you? Because it really is a reciprocal relationship. If they're not feeling connected to you, cared for, seen by you, like you're respecting their boundaries and their time, you know, good luck on getting them to deliver when you need them to. So being able to go have that radical honesty with your people is profound. And you have to set that up. You have to set the context up for that. So if you're not doing that already, for those of you listening, absolutely set that context up with your people. Like, can you tell me how I'm doing and leading you? And then listen. And, And here, really, they're talking about their preferences, 
So where some people might love to, for you to say good morning, other people hate it. So, okay, mm -hmm. great. This person doesn't like it. Respect their preferences. Uh, and then also be honest about your own. You know, one of the things that is true for me is I am not a morning person and I despise email. So mm -hmm. please do not send me emails and do not call me before 10. <laughs> do not want to be bothered. And for the longest time, I just didn't say that to people. I just was really kind of like, okay, like I'll bend to what they need. And that would make me very resentful. So I have learned to really put the line in the sand to go, actually, no, do not call me before 10. And please, like if the email is more than three sentences, we must do a call because I, I can't oh, process all. Yes, 100%. Right? I have a rule with my team, four sentences. You know, yeah. I, I call it my rule of four. If, if a, yeah. you know, a Slack message goes back and forth more than four times, get up and talk to the person. If the email is more than four sentences, don't expect me to read past that point. Yeah. And, you know, just call me and give me the update or, or write it better. You yeah. know, spend exactly. more time to write it shorter. Absolutely. And then it really is like getting clear on the preferences that your the people on your teams have, whether it's how they want to be mm -hmm. recognized, how they want to be communicated to and with, how they like to learn. The, the, there's all these styles and I can get into them if you would like for me to do it, to do that. But so those, the, those pieces get clear on the preferences and then be honest about your own. And then your job as the leader is to ensure that you're managing to all that to, so that the team feels cared for and you can properly coalesce. Yeah. And I think one thing uh, to add on to that is whenever you do get that feedback to understand that um, don't be defensive, listen to it and understand that the person that gave you that feedback was being very brave in order to do so. Um, you, you know, cause they wouldn't, you, you know, a lot, a lot of times our, our reaction is to justify the fact that we're just being nice and yes. not actually listen and take it to heart. Yes, exactly. It's very common to be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, that's <laughs> not true. Or I disagree when someone gives you feedback. Uh, you know, what's true is that we spend a lot of time learning how to give feedback as leaders. Like we take a bunch of courses on that. Mm -hmm. It's important to also learn how to receive it. Mm. And uh, as you were just saying, not getting defensive, because if you do get defensive, your people are not going to come back to you and tell you again. Right. Like, what's the point? You were just mean to me and it's scary to talk to your boss. So now if I just got yelled at or dismissed, like I'm not coming back, which then means you have a problem on your hands because your team is not speaking up about the pain points that they're dealing with. And your job as a leader in the leader function is to remove obstacles so people can really thrive in their jobs, like as the leader, right? As a manager, you have other functions, but as a leader, remove obstacles so people can thrive. And if they're not able to communicate with you, you're just going to get, you know, that fake story. Like, Everything is great. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they go gossip behind your back. Yeah. So, so um, help me with this. Cause I know when I was first starting out in management, I felt like I had to always be right to earn the respect of my team, which is, I know now that's hundred percent wrong, but that led to a lot of defensive uh, posturing and I guess behavior and justifications of the reason why I do things and the feel, I felt like I, I had to explain it in detail to get them on my side. Um, and now I know that's wrong. What should I have been doing, you know, during those situations? So it's actually um, a little bit of a complicated question because there's so mm -hmm. many pieces to it. Okay. Uh, I want to I, I start off by talking about a principle that we teach at Handel Group because I think sure. it's an important principle to land us in. So there's this principle that we teach called the power of one, and it ties into relationship dynamics. Uh, sometimes when I explain it to people, they get a little confused because we use numbers and, you know, to explain it, but essentially what we mean in the power of one is that there is a hierarchy and a pecking order in everything that we do, right? Mm -hmm. And in the hierarchy and pecking order, there is like a code of conduct for how you're gonna act. So you as the boss really do get the final say. You get to make the call and you get to override everybody because you're the boss and ultimately it falls on your shoulders, mm -hmm. right? So in the hierarchy of you being the boss, like you really are above everybody, okay? And that's important to note, but that, lives in the physical world, right? It doesn't live in the world of the relationship where you're emotionally connecting with people, having to lead them, get buy-in, convince, coalesce, cause cohesion, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And in that world, there is no, you're above them. You're both equal, like equal professionals with the pains and ideas for how to do something. And any time where you don't see somebody equal on the playing fields of how you relate to them, right? So not in the physical, so clear, you're the boss, right? Anytime you're not seeing them as equal and you do what we call tooing somebody, meaning you make them less than you, 
Mm-hmm. And the way that people do this is we go into like judging them or comparing them or uh, doing some level being in competition with them. So anytime we start to like, or, you know, doubt, have doubt come in, anytime we do some version of that, it hurts your ability to get that person on board with you. Try, like not being an equal playing field makes it impossible to get alignment and agreement. And so whenever you're trying to prove yourself as right, it really is like you want to go cause domain and mm. you want to be seen as a person who was right. So there is a level of competition and there is a level of comparison. Um, and there's a level of doubt that kind of gets thrown in there in terms of like, I don't know if I trust that person because I know that I'm right. right. So the um, reason why I brought this up is because many leaders fall into this particular pitfall we know that we're the leader. We know that we mostly have the right answers and how to do something, but then we have to really guide our people to it. And the best way to go do that is to always be on an equal playing field and never to someone. That's really tough to do sometimes though. You know, yeah. Especially like, you know, I, I grew up playing sports. I'm very competitive. And sometimes I see like the uh, different viewpoints as almost a competition, like you were saying, and you, you want to win that competition. Uh, and it's really hard to kind of step back and say, no, we're on the same team here. We're not competing. Yes. Perspective is everything. Perspective. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. As we were chatting earlier, I was sharing about my husband and perspective is everything. He's still, he's still learning that. Um, <laughs> that's an important quality. The minute you drop into competition, uh, self doubt, you know, in some way a mm-hmm. com- or a comparison with somebody um, or like a level of jealousy or whatever, right? Like the different forms that all these things can take on for people. The minute you drop into that, you're out of being a leader. Now you're making it about you. Mm. Leadership is about caring about the we, the team. And if you're not really super and like almost myopically focused on the team and you slip into caring about you, you've lost the team. And it's, it takes work to be able to take yourself out of that competitive state. And in coaching, we teach people how to do that, actually. We teach people to go, okay, well, this is how you do it. You go into being competitive. And then, okay, this is what the impact of that is. And then this is how we're going to go mitigate that for you so that you can learn how to get yourself quickly out of that uh, competition mode and back into where you're the most powerful, which likely for you, John, would be some version of like understanding, really listening, um, analyzing the ideas, like whatever version that is for you, but getting quickly out of that competition and into back into the state of coming from your highest self. Yeah. I know for me, it takes, um, very intentional, uh, effort, uh, for that point. Like, for example, when I'm giving a one-on-one, I spend a few minutes beforehand trying to put myself in that person's mindset. Whenever I see like, sometimes on team, somebody will send me something and I think they're wrong. And instead of just firing off, I have to stop and talk about what's the end goal here. You know, the end goal is that we achieve this project or thing. It's not that we do it my way. Um, so let me back off a little bit, you know, and, and I have to, I have to think about what is the end goal? What is the, you know, is it, you know, like you said, leadership is not about we, it's about, I mean, it is about we, it's not about me. You know, mm-hmm. you have to, I have to always say that, you know, to my mind. And a lot of times it's just changing my words. Instead of saying, I think I say we should, you know, and I start say, saying the words we and us instead of me and my and I, and that changes my mindset a little bit, makes it a little bit easier for me to uh, um, not be as competitive. Yes. And that's a great hack, by the way, reframing it to the we and the us mm-hmm. is powerful because it really does land. It, it's inclusive versus exclusive. Right. And it lands people in that place of like, okay, we're in this together. And while it sounds sort of silly and like, yeah, right. Does, does that word really matter? It does. Um, it actually doesn't change how people view you and it does change how they feel that they can, speak up or not speak up. So good technique and hack there. I will also add to you, and I don't don't know Mm -hmm. if you're doing this, but I teach my clients that it's important to come from curiosity. So instead of making statements, ask questions and authentic questions, right? Not patronizing ones, Mm -hmm. but authentic questions where you're like, okay, I'm curious, like, how did you get to this? Or I'm curious your thought process, or, you know, can you explain more to me about this? I, have a question about X, right? Really, truly coming from curiosity versus coming from a place of I disagree, or I don't follow your logic, or this doesn't make sense. This is not what we discussed. Like those statements uh, don't have any room 
for true sort of like back and forth conversation. They are like a statement that equals now go defend yourself. And so you'll quickly find yourself in an argument with somebody or somebody kind of backpedaling or tripping over their words or, def or defending themselves in some way if you approach challenges with statements. Mm -hmm. I think that's really good advice um, to, to approach them with a curiosity, you know, and um, I was talking to someone not too long ago about the fact that, you know, we as leaders need to be more curious than d declarative. You know, we, we, tell, we like to always give people, you know, uh, and you look at the old TV shows, it was always like the, the mean boss that would always just tell people what to do. And in reality, we need to be approaching problems with curiosity, especially in the tech field, because I think, you know, as in, as a technology person, our jobs are constantly changing. We are constantly having to, you know, reinvent the, the tools and things that we use as new languages come out, new things are, are are being created every day. And and even I guess everybody's doing this now with COVID, that that everything has kind of changed and we're having to refigure things out. And I think approaching things with curiosity makes a huge difference. Absolutely. So um what are some, some other pieces of advice that you might have for a, a new leader that let's say they were managing a team and now they, you know, got promoted into the, the dreaded role of being the manager of that team that they used to be on? Um, what are some, some pieces of advice that they can start doing? Because they probably already know the people, they have that good relationship because they used to work with them, but now they're their boss. How do you, how do you go, go through that experiment of, of, of shifting around and what are some advice that you would have for someone in that role? So the biggest downfall I see is that people don't set up the new code of conduct for how they're going to work together. And then anything that was true in the previous relationship that they had that uh, perhaps may have been off or a challenge or an issue only gets exacerbated by the fact that now you are the leader. And so the first step is to sit down with yourself and really think about the code of conduct that you want with your direct reports or employees, however you view them. First part is getting really clear on the meeting structures, the ways that you like to communicate, and all the different sort of processes that you need to put in place, not for the management piece, because likely if you've been, if you've been elevated to manager, you know how to do that management piece well, but for the leadership piece. So there really is like, where do you do the team building? Where do you do the relationship building? Where do you do like the taking care of people? Mm -hmm. So it's sitting down and really designing that. And then also the process by which that happens because you're a busy person. So if you're running a big team, you got a lot on your plate and it's like, oh crap, I haven't sent like a thank you email to this person. And it's like seven o'clock on a Friday. So you really do have to think about how you operationalize all these leadership tasks and put them into your calendar so that you actually have the time and space to do them just like they're an appointment to do something that you would be managing like if you're updating a spreadsheet on something or whatever it might be so that's the first part the second piece is wherever the relationship was off before or wherever you might have a worry that there could be some trip up in your personality or in your uh, ability to work well together to go have the difficult conversation. A lot of times when people get elevated from a team into a manager or a leadership position, there is this internal competition. Like, why did he get that job? Why did she get that job? How come it wasn't me? So you're going to have to deal with those obstacles. And it's best to identify who on your new team is going to be upset. And how do you build the rapport so that we're not causing issues in the future? I think that is absolutely great advice. Um, and I think we should close with that because that was just, um, you know, I think that hit the nail on the head. How can people find out more about you and connect with you and learn more about the things that you guys are doing over at the uh, Hendel Group? Yeah, thank you for asking. So you can find more about Hendel Group at our website, hendelgroup.com. If you are interested in learning more about me, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, that is Krissa. Z voice at um, LinkedIn, and then also on Instagram. I reference those two platforms because in my world, I do a lot of um, speaking and promoting around issues of DEI, uh, equity, specifically in the workforce, and then also inclusion. And I do a lot of uh, speaking around women in leadership. So if anyone's listening, 
that cares about those topics, uh, if you go hunt me specifically on the interweb, you will find a bunch of videos, content, blogs, other podcasts in which I talk about these things. Also, for anybody who is a new leader and is like, okay, you know, I might need some coaching and I know I have to look at myself. We as a company have created a product called Inner You. Mm -hmm. And we created this product because the truth is, coaching can have a big barrier to entry because it can be quite expensive and very time consuming. And while companies are usually very happy to pay for coaching, sometimes it is a little bit of an uphill battle. So this product is a learner led uh, digital coaching program where essentially you get everything you would experience in a coaching engagement, but in a do it yourself at your own pace format. And so if you're new to a job and you really deeply want to upgrade yourself and want to understand your own inner workings, what drives you, what motivates you. You know, if you're like John and have a big comp competitive trait, <laughs> or if you're like me and have a big defensive trait, because that's what I do when <laughs> someone gives me feedback, I'm like, you know, screw you, leave me alone. Um, you know, th that program would be really useful to just get you into the basics. Um, that's called it are you. We have a couple of different uh, categories of the program. The one I would recommend for people listening is the career program in our you career. It is the one in which we also talk about the relationship dynamic components that I've been speaking to on this uh, podcast. And uh, it would be useful if you're going to be managing a team to understand how to really drive those dynamics. Awesome. I'm going to link all that up in the show notes as well as your Instagram, the website and uh, uh, your LinkedIn. And uh, again, I really appreciate having you on the show. It's been a lot of fun. I enjoyed the conversation and I uh, hope you have a great week. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast. Hope you guys enjoyed that interview. And if so, please share it with a friend. Don't forget to leave a rating and review in Apple Podcast and share the episode on social media. And also, don't forget about our sponsor, the Manning's Math for Data Science Conference. It's a free event on December 1st, and you can find out more about that at geekleader.com math.